This week for our local fixture, I had the pleasure of sitting down with the voice of the Round Rock Express, Mike Caps. So, Mike, I had the pleasure of running, uh, running the board, doing some engineering mm-hmm. for the uh, Round Rock Express games right. this summer and, and into the fall. And what a pleasure it was working with you. It was great to work down the line from you. But hanging out in a room with you is an even bigger pleasure, and I can't thank you enough for well, being here. Well, uh, you're too kind, uh, and, and it was fun working with you. I, I've always said the, the real pros stand out, and you certainly did. Well, I, Thank you, and um, that's quite a high honor. I I really appreciate that. Um, And, you know, I was very aware of what what it is that you do, Um, but when I was able to come and visit you and and stand behind you as you were calling the game, um, and luckily I think it was the last homestand that that the Express had, um, that's when I saw the magic. You you don't have hardly anything in front of you. It's all up here in your brain, isn't it? It is. It, it's five and a half hours of serious prep every day and then about an hour and a half workout and then go to the ballpark and pick up as much tidbits about what's going on in the organization with, with the Express and with the other team and the other team's organization, and then you rock and roll. Well, what's your – you say five and a half hours of prep. Is that start at home? Mm-hmm. Sure. What are yes. you What are you reading? You reading? The- I'm up at seven o'clock. I'm I'm on USSportsPages dot com, and I'm going to go through the Dallas Morning News. I'm going to go through the Fort Worth Star Telegram. I'm going to go through. Let's just say we're playing Omaha. I'm going to go through the Omaha World Herald. I'm going to go through um, the Austin paper. I'm going to go through the Kansas City paper because they're a Royals affiliate. And we're going to get right down to business, and I'm going to take some notes. I may not use any of it throughout the broadcast, Jimmy, but I have it there as a backup. And I'm going to mix and match that from what I hear at batting practice, from what I talk to the managers, the coaches, the pitching coach about his pitcher, what he throws, our pitcher, what he throws. And it all gets thrown into this big compendium of available information and any kind of stories I can pick up, I'm going to repeat stories. Not a lot of young broadcasters and not a lot of old broadcasters in baseball now, radio or TV, do that. But if, I think it makes it a much more interesting broadcast if you can, if you can bring it down and, and, and tell a story through somebody else's eyes. Uh, if somebody's experienced something. Somebody's been, uh, say his parents were trapped in, in, uh, in a foreign country or while he was growing up. Any kind of little lanyap like that just makes it so much more interesting. Well, and at the minor league level, which uh, the Round Rock Express are a top-notch uh, minor league organization. What mm-hmm. division are they? Triple A. Triple A. One step from the big leagues. One step from the big leagues, and we did see quite a bit of these guys. Huh. I, I, yes. I, I was, in a short amount of time, able to build a relationship with them. Sure. Mainly because you sell these guys to the public, don't you, with those stories. Well, yeah, and—, and Everybody is interested in – okay, anybody can spit back batting averages and hitting streaks and those sorts of things. But um, if you have a story that uh, somebody has overcome a problem or has um, come to the country, like some of the Cuban refugees we've mm-hmm. had come through have actually come over, floated over on, on a boat. Trash. On a boat. Homemade boats. Right? I mean, people relate to that. It's, this is why baseball is such a beautiful game, told on radio. It doesn't work so much on television unless the broadcaster is interested in doing that kind of thing and the color guy. Well, y- But it's, it's, it's a blessing to get to do it, number one. And number two is it is ready-made. The pacing of it is ready-made for stories to really push, push the point home and make people see it, which is what we try to do. You know, that was uh, the first time that I had the opportunity to run um, a baseball game. And I, throughout my radio broadcasting career, have been told dead air is is a no no, fear dead air. But sometimes those dramatic pauses, Mike, you caught me. <laughs> I, I don't know. If, I don't know if I ever threw it to a break accidentally or not because I thought thought you were uh, you had gone to break or or if it, it was just sure. a pause. But you know, there's there's something about. Just taking a breath while that pitcher is stretching out. The great dramatic actors really build to a crescendo. And the pacing again. 
of a baseball game, especially if there's activity going on, if there's traffic on the bases or base hits working, there is a crescendo you build to. I don't consciously do it. It, it you know, having done this in like 19 years or 18 or 20 or whatever it is, I can't remember. Doesn't matter because it's so much fun. They all run together. That said, uh, you do build a crescendo, and and if you have to stop and take a breath, or let the the crowd noise come up, all it does is connect people's ears, and more importantly, their eyes right. to the field, even though they're not there. And that's what's called making people see it. The theater of the mind. That's exactly what it is. And I was supposed to go to bed at 8 o'clock as a young child, and there was many times where I sat up underneath my desk listening to AM radio. Yes, sir. Some Orioles broadcasts with Cal Ripken. I think Billy might have been playing right. back at the time. Right, Maybe his dad was still the the skipper. Um, so I – and then also hockey. Listening to hockey, I love hockey on on the radio. Hockey on radio is beautiful. If if the announcer is really worth his salt, now you say you want to give you some names that many people won't remember. There was a hockey announcer named Dan Kelly in St. Louis, who you could hear. I was so blessed. I, there were seven signals, strong fifty thousand watt signals that blew into Fairfield, Texas, south of Dallas, where I was raised. And, and of course, you got to hear the Masters. Ernie Harwell, the late Ernie Harwell in Detroit, I could hear him well. He later became a mentor of mine. Uh, Jack Buck, Harry Carey, uh, Bill Mercer, my buddy, who still does games first on minor league games on KRLD in Dallas, 50,000 watts, and then uh, the original Rangers announcer. And and those, Jimmy, you can't replace those. I mean, I understand coming in from a little league game and and taking a shower and jumping in with that radio and tuning it around to see how many games I could hear. Mm-hmm. That, that's just what I did, and, and you did. We've, we've had that discussion before. And it's a beautiful thing to listen to the syntax, and, and I don't think anybody's teaching that to young broadcasters anymore, which is a shame. But that's, that's the way we were raised. You and I are children of radio, and I think that's great. They, they teach you the equipment. Um, they teach you the principles of how to record signal and edit the signal. Um, but but yes, the the old older guys are are not passing it on so much, and that's why I'm not letting you go. Okay, well, Cause, <laughs> good because I need to learn from you. It's still. a populist game, and 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 the whole deal is. I had a I had a chance to take a four year old boy and his father on a tour of the ballpark, and the kid listens to us every night, and uh, my grandsons listen in on the internet, the the uh, four of them, and they get it, they get it, and it's a beautiful beautiful thing because we're passing it along generation to generation, and but it's such a popular populist game and people. People, it's people, people, people. It's it's touching people. Right. Beautiful, beautiful way to live your life. Now, we were originally going to try and do this interview on a Tuesday night. Right. Um, but there's something that you love more than baseball. Sure. And that's your wife. Well, she's my sweetheart. Okay. We're not officially married, but that's the way it goes. Your sweetheart. and I've Known and her for years and years she, and years. She's, she's beautiful. She's got you all wrapped up on Tuesday in something. What What is it that you're doing Well, on we belong to Terrytown United Methodist Church, and we go to a, a Disciple One Bible study. And um, I was raised uh, with faith. I got away from it for many years, uh, trailing across the world in the news business and uh Bouts with um, drugs and bouts with uh, ego and uh, post-traumatic stress over what I'd seen and and those sorts of things. And at the end of the day, um, uh, it, that all that world that that high money world came crashing down, and it had to get solved. And if you think there's not a God in heaven, the therapist that dealt with me was a licensed Presbyterian lay minister, but a four-tour of duty side gunner on a helicopter in Nam, And I had covered the Gulf War for CNN. I'd been a young cop beat reporter at age 23 in Houston when that was one of the most violent cities ever in the history of the world. And you, you have to stuff that someplace. You stuff it someplace. And it all came up and out, and it had to be dealt with, and it took three years. But, yeah, 
yeah, I'm a man of faith and proud of it. Yeah, I think I told you when when you said you couldn't couldn't come and and do this. I I, I said, well, I believe that God comes before cable access television <laughs> shows. <laughs> well, I, I should hope so, but right. uh, I, I'm just pleased to be here with you. Well, um, we all have a, a reason for being here, and right. you know, some of us are are still searching. Um, well, I'll I'll point point the fingers at me. You know, you're still, well on your way. Still, still trying to figure it out. I want to do everything um, at the same time. Well, as 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 you're finding your happy place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I and tell me if I'm if I'm treading on on dangerous ground here, but I want to talk about how you got your start in journalism. Um, as as a as a reporter, how how did that come about? Did you study it in college? Was this something that you planned on, or did you have another goal w- coming out of high school? I was a college baseball player, and l- nineteen years after I was invited to a Montreal Expos tryout camp, I found out that the Montreal Expos were going to try to sign me and send me out because I could really run. Um, I ended up working for the scout, who. Uh, wanted to sign me part-time. I wrote a book about him. He's a scout who discovered Nolan Ryan, God rest his soul, a man of faith himself. Um, And uh, that's the direction I was headed. Um, It got way off because I I had a low Vietnam draft number, and uh, I was in a journalism class at Hill Junior College in Hillsboro, and we were trying to find a term project. You work on term projects. I was trying to find one. And we were striking out. We went to the newspapers. Every little town around Hillsborough had a weekly, and we just couldn't get a place to go write anything. So we're driving around after practice one day, and we see the, the, the antenna at the local radio station in Hillsborough, and three of us just march ourselves in there, and we were ordered to get out until we finally turned around and came back in and told the guy, look, he, he said, I know you guys are baseball players, and I see your pictures in the paper and blah, 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 whatever. I said, well, we'll work for free. We just need free. So he gives us three hours and to do a sports talk show on Saturday morning, at KHBR in Hillsborough. And so we're, we're punching each other on the shoulders. We get back in the car, and then we realize, what are we going to do? Yeah, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> and it worked out. It worked out great. And that became my baseball scholarship, So, and, and I transferred to Sam Houston State. I did everything, news, sports, weather, you name it, local, local, local. So by the time I finished college at Sam Houston State, I already had two and a half years of uh, professional experience, experience when I hit. And that's why I was able to go to Houston at such a young age. So you, you, didn't, you didn't become an, an all-star in the major leagues? No, okay. and wanted to badly. Yeah, I mean you you love this game. Oh, it's oh, it's like it's a part of me. My grandfather was a Pirates prospect and was going to be the next third baseman for the Pirates, and he goes to World War One, and he's in the artillery and loses hearing and one of the, and lost balance and couldn't play. But he mm-hmm. passed the game along. It's a beautiful thing, and I know he's upstairs looking down and just smiling on what this potential train wreck it was has turned to become, and I'm I'm pleased about that. So. Um, you 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 went to school. You you studied the art, mm-hmm. and then how'd you find yourself at CNN? Well, through a series of serendipities, I think uh, you, you just work yourself to the bone. I had uh, had gone from uh, Channel Two in Houston to WFAA Television in Dallas. Um, had had a long run of success there. I was um. One, a producer and I actually broke the stories that got SMU the death penalty. And uh, that led to a whole lot of uh, runs from networks. And um, what really got me to the next step initially, uh, I was covering a hurricane in Houston in, in the early 80s that hit that, that hit hard. Which one was this? Is I can't remember. Andrew? Or? It, it may have been Andrew. Long story short, uh my story led ABC World News Tonight on both versions, East and West Coast. First time a local correspondent had ever had that happen. Well, here we come. 
network president comes down and where, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? This was, it didn't work out. I ended up in management at ABC. I was a deputy bureau chief over 14 states and responsible for all ABC news coverage. And that sort of went away. And I get back, and less than a year later, I'm get, getting calls from Atlanta and CNN, and I get signed on. And what year is this? This is 1990. 1990. And, uh, Before the Gulf War. I got on right in the middle of the abortion, anti-abortion wars in 1990 on the steps of the, uh, the Capitol in Louisiana mm-hmm. and in Kansas. And uh, the next thing you know, away I go overseas, parts of eight months over there. The original Gulf War. The original Gulf War. Right. O- Operation Desert. F- I was there for Freedom. Desert Shield. Desert Shield. I went out. 44 hours they have this war. And I'm back over right after it ended, and I'm up in the mountains of northern Iraq with the Kurdish refugees. And I don't know if you're old enough to remember the pictures of all these people living on the mountainsides, and it was horrendous. And uh, some really rough scrapes of the Peshmerga, the 19 to 25-year-olds who made up the part of their army, uh, were taught by the British Royal Marines. They were taught guerrilla fighting tactics, and so uh, they would actually go in to the Iraqi camps, those Iraqi soldiers were harassing those folks, steal their munitions, and away we'd go with this nasty, nasty fights. Mm. The last day we were in theater, we're trying to get into one of these little northern Iraqi towns. People had started coming down out of the mountains, and some Iraqi soldiers had it blocked. And so we're we're um, outside this town. It's me, it's BBC, it's NBC, uh, it's ABC, and I'm pretty sure um, NPR, from what I re- recall. And all of a sudden, here come uh, four trucks full of Republican Guard. They had their AKs and they had their bayonets. And I'm thinking, here we are. We've had so many scrapes over these years in this business. And I'm going to get a bayonet in the throat the last day I'm in theater. Well, lo and behold, over the mountain comes two AK, uh, uh, A-10 Warthogs. My favorite place. Plane. Unbelievable planes, and they buzz these guys, and they ran off, and we're all looking at each other like, you kidding me? So that was the end of the war skirmishes, and then we had the Midwest floods, and then we had Haiti and all this kind of thing, and finally I just burned myself out to the point where I wake up one night, I have the bed post in my, I've hit myself across the head, I'm bleeding, and got into therapy, and the rest was history. Now, um... I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you uh, about, I mean, you, you've mentioned that you uh, are a survivor of PTSD, yep. right? Yep. Um, there's quite a few people in this country that, that are currently suffering from PTSD. and um, I and, probably had the lightest case of it you ever heard of, but I'll tell you what, it hurt. It physically, physically hurt. And it mentally hurt. Let's, let's just talk real quick about getting help. Because you asked for help, yep. and you got it. I did. There's a lot of people out there that don't know that they're even struggling. They just feel bad, right? You know, you're talking about a, a physical hurt. Jimmy, I had a precursor three weeks before this episode where I busted my head wide open. We were doing a little feature story outside of Denver, and there was an 80-year-old lady who was a morning drive disc jockey, and it's a happy story. And I think I'm the happy I'd, – I'd never made – as much money in my life as I was making then. Right. I thought I was the happiest guy alive. And the only, we were set up listening to this radio show inside a beauty shop. And I'm, I'm seated in one of the chairs, and they're working on other two, couple of ladies' hair. And, and, and the owner of the shop comes up to me, and she says, Mr. Caps, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're the blackest soul I've ever met in my life. And I said, excuse me? Just unsolicited. Unsolicited. It's the blackest soul I've ever met in my life. What in the world is going on with you? I said, Adam, I don't know. You know, I've got this great job. And I'm happy. She said, I, whatever, I'm just telling you. And I don't mean to be rugged about it. I don't mean, mean to be mean about it. And I thought, well, how dare she, she do that? And then three weeks later, boom, and a, she saw it. Yeah. She saw it. She spotted it. Yeah. Uh, it, just to tell you how it feels. It was a cloud. I, oh, a cloud of angst and hurt and Instant anger, instant fired up anger, mm-hmm. 
and it just absolutely I didn't realize how worn out I was by the whole thing but I mean when you're in your when this starts when you're in your teens because my 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 late father God rest his soul had been a, an Angus rancher but he also ran the emergency ambulance service in a little town and people dying in car wrecks all up and down so he dies and I pick up the slack and I'm out there picking up carnage and it just kept going and going and going until the time I'm in my early 40s and it just blows apart hmm. yeah it, i really do thank the man upstairs for what's happened in my life i'll be honest with you so um and maybe maybe now you're able to look at it as a, a blessing and, and maybe maybe a lesson from the guy upstairs to slow down a little bit when you when you had a, a little procedure recently well right? it, it was two years ago and and it really had nothing to do with any lifestyle issues Ninety-seven percent, as I'm told, of the world's population is born with a three-flap aortic valve. I was born with two, and they wore out, so they replace it. And then there were some complications that that got serious. And but I walked out, and the surgeon who did the surgery told me, had I not been in such great physical shape from all the work I'd done from college on in terms of running and lifting and that sort of thing, it would have been a real problem. Mm-hmm. But it, it was a blessing, and it, what it did, as much as anything else, was begin a transformation from where I was to being a better person, being a better broadcaster, being a better father for my kids and grandkids, being a better partner and just uh, for my sweetheart and just being a better guy. Yeah. So it helped, helped speed along There's the no process. There's no question about that. Yeah. No question. Well, sometimes we need to sit back and relax. Yes. Yeah. Well. Guys like us, Mike. <laughs> What were you know? eight personalities, Jimmy? As part of why we're, um, so I, you know, I think, I think a lot of young students these days they think that they're gonna finish school, go and uh, join a broadcast um, outfit, and and just go hit the ground running. It, I don't know if you had a lot of grunt work <laughs> in in your time, but uh-huh. let's speak about that. I mean, sure. there 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 are times when you've got to just carry the nails right oh there's no question about that no question about that when you started a little tiny radio station and you build to another little tiny radio station uh you put everybody has to pay dues there are very few there are very few mike trouts of the world who walk out of high school and into a big league situation in any profession and i believe really truly believe that until you understand how your art form works from the base up you're never going to be uh the writer the artist the broadcaster the performer you can be until you understand where everybody is and what everybody has to do to make you look or sound good and yeah i've carried my share of nails and and, and you're right and that's a great way to put it yeah, you, and you you have to hand them off, and even if you don't like the way that they're getting hammered in, you just got to stand there with your bucket well, that's of it. nails. And 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 where, you, where the learning process comes from taking your own ideas and your own thought process, and in your own way in a different setting, making things better. Mm. Yeah, I, I truly believe that. I see a lot of frustration with some of the young younger um, students that I sure. run around with, sure. um, and and they just don't don't understand how hard it actually still is going to get but it's it it look let's give credit to people who are at the top of their profession whether it's baseball players whether it's broadcasters television radio news sports whatever those people make it look really easy and they get paid a whole lot of money and so if you're a kid sitting watching this and I don't sense that so many listen that much anymore mm-hmm. But if you're sitting and you're watching this, it looks easy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that guy, that, that woman, she's no better looking than I am. He's no better looking than I am. I can do I can this. Do I can hit well, on, guess what? on the microphone. Guess what? It's a whole different kettle of fish once you're on, on this side of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we were talking to um, Mr. Garrett Green the other day. Sure. and Or just earlier before this interview. And, you know, I see the hard work that he does. Oh, he's, he's putting in hard work 
for for these high school football games. Sure, but this is a guy that was aspiring to be, you know, calling UT games. Sure, one day. Sure, or maybe a pro game. Um, hopefully not the Cowboys, right? Hopefully, <laughs> somebody. No, more get res- me started on that now. That's <laughs> the you know, there's the hometown team, and okay, whatever. So, <laughs> I I think the kids they they gotta they gotta know. Uh, know what they're getting into so you know as they said in airplane they bought their tickets <laughs> i say let them crash right yeah. <laughs> that's talk. one of my favorite movies i can sit there's two or three the field of dreams league of their own airplane you know you don't even have Cannonball to have a, run you don't even have to oh my heavens you don't even have to have a cool frosty to just laugh your backside off right. of those no that's question classic. about it the fog's getting thicker yes sir leon's getting larger <laughs> Uh, a hospital, what is it? Um, let's talk about radio ownership. Let's do that. How has it changed since 1996? Well, you know what? I haven't been in the ownership ranks except for about four years. And okay. I have two business partners, and we own uh, one of the oldest radio stations in the country, and the in Corsicana. And it's it's a beautiful thing to watch. Uh, we wish it made us a ton of money. It doesn't, but it's local. We've given back to that community, which is right close to where I was. Well, raised. the airwaves are a public trust. Yes, they are. And it sounds yes, like you are. you haven't forgotten that. Well, what happened was the owner that we bought it from had had actually worked at that place and uh, had gotten a little off path. Had was running every talk show you could hear in Dallas Fort Worth. Well, it's forty five miles from Dallas Fort Worth, right. of course, Canada. And all we did was get uh, we went back to the citizens of Corsicana. We got we got the the junior college sports news and everything lined up from Navarro Junior College. We got that back. We got all of Corsicana high school sports back. We became Uber local and we're still trying to get better at that. And uh, we're paying our bills and but the beautiful thing about it is and and Bob Cole here and I have had had this discussion about What's, what they're trying to do here at the Austin Radio Network is, is sort of the same. from Coke FM. Yes, and, and that's uh, a great friend of mine. And, and the bottom line is they're on a much bigger scale, you guys are trying to do what what we're trying to do on, on a very small scale in Corsicana. And, and it's really the only niche that radio can take right now as far as I'm, as I'm concerned. Stay local. local. Absolutely. Well, and we're seeing that as, as these conglomerates are almost starting to part off some of the mm-hmm. the land grab, so to speak. Um, That's a great way to put it. They were picking up these stations left and right, pi- overvaluing them, um, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and then they were they were set up to, for failure, right. right? And then they're sitting in some of these local markets, running national programming and failing because they weren't connecting with the public. Well, I mean, think about it. What's to connect them? Yeah, they're getting they're getting their program from somebody in New you York sit City. In your car, and uh, you can hear the same program in Nashville, Memphis, Tuscaloosa, Austin, Denver. It's all the same guy, all the same lady. Why? Why would you do that if you if you wanted any information about what your day is going to be like? Oh yeah, they do drop ins for weather and news. That's not the important thing. It is who uh, the morning drive person is on 104.9 The Horn. It is who Bob Cole is on Coke FM. It is who uh, the guys in the afternoon are. People are driving in their cars. JB and Sandy. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, the and aren't they great? I yeah. mean, they, they they talk about performers and know what they're doing. They're great. But the bottom line is you got to have those people to make it work locally. And it's got to be. you got to touch Austin. you got to touch Corsicana. you got to touch... Dallas Fort Worth. It's it, it it's really not magic what you have to do, and that's appeal to people in your particular city. So you're saying there's hope for radio? I still. don't think there's any question. I just had a discussion on the way over here with a fellow named Gary Delon, who's 81 years old and still broadcasts high school football. I knew him at OKL Life in Dallas when he was one of the best radio news reporters you ever heard, and we're talking about that same thing about connectivity locally. And how it's gone away, and what a what a shame that is. But slowly but surely, the Austin radio networks of the world are starting to realize that we got to do it this way. Mm-hmm. 
because this is worth saving. And you know what? It is. Yeah. It well, is. I mean, I no I question listen, about it. I listen to the radio as soon as I'm in my car. Sure. Um, at home. Sorry, I'm watching your old uh, alma mater, CNN. Well, and uh, and Fox. You know, you got to keep your well, enemies. You, you got to go. You got to. You, you got to. My whole deal about that is, and I tell people, sample it all. Sample it all. Just understand there are agendas working here. And, oh, yeah. And, and see through them and be smart enough and educate yourself and read a little bit, read a newspaper occasionally, maybe like every day. And, you know, we see this in – as We could radio, go radio, crazy with this radio's and get gonna fired. Forever. <laughs> radio's going to live forever. I think so. But is journalism dying? Because, you oh, know, you just, you just – Triggered a thought, you know, consider the source. That's what I do. I read all my news rags online now. I used to every morning start with my Washington Post, but now it's all online. And then I watch all the the different media outlets that I watch. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, I pull the story out Mm -hmm. from the crevices Mm -hmm. because it's Mm -hmm. it's infotainment now. It is. And it is. What, what what is what is happening? Are, are we ever going to see journalism have a rebirth like radio? Maybe I'm a little more pessimistic about that than I am about local ownership of radio. OK, uh, I, I think there's a chance over the next 20 years for people locally to be better informed by radio than they've ever been before. If local programmers really pick up the ball and run with it, which I think they will. Um if you wanted to criticize, and I don't mean to criticize here, you, you would have to look at big corporations that have bought up a lot of networks. And what is the um, what's the sense in real deep investigative journalism for a corporation if you're going to have to defend yourself in court? Mm. Um, now that said, there's the Brian Rosses of the world are still going going crazy on ABC and doing a great job and. Uh, listen, let – what was it the Founding Fathers said? Let facts be disseminated to a candid public, something around those mm-hmm. lines. And uh, if you're going to make a democracy work, if you're going to make this country work, you have to have, you must have an informed citizenry. There's no way around it. And it's not easy being an American citizen. Uh Politics has become a real complicated game. Uh, people who are in that arena are they're well-meaning, but it's gotten complicated. Mm-hmm. And, and to sort it all out, we as citizens have to be smart enough to sit down and spend a little time educating ourselves about it. I just don't think that we can do this without the electorate being educated and i cheer for us so much to do that because this is such a great country and it offers so much but we have to be smart yeah we the electorate i mean an informed electorate is the most it's the backbone necessary thing for a democracy and we started voting today here in texas early voting started today that's right um very important midterm election do you do you dabble in politics you ever thought about running let me tell you something. Um, I covered politics for so many years. I had uh, I had a vice presidential candidate in the 1992 election I followed for the last, I don't know, four or five months of, of that campaign. Um, I, I have a pretty good handle on how both parties work. Um, I applaud their efforts. I, I just I want to see more than anything else in this country. I want to see the rebirth of statesmen. And the ability to Jimmy, you and I may agree, may disagree on some things, and we probably do. But two people who respect each other should be able to sit down and come up together with a better idea than you had or I had separately. Mm-hmm. Um, Mr. Sam Rayburn was one of the greatest statesmen we ever had, Speaker of the House, back when I was a kid, and his whole deal was. Here, there's a bottle of wild turkey here, a couple of glasses. You boys are going to sit in this office next to mine and work it out. Figure it out. Lock the and, door. And nine times out of ten, they did. Right. And, and I just, I so want that for this country. I so want us to be able to heal the hurts and wounds and stop calling each other names. And, and, and 
be great citizens. We have so much to be thankful for here. Yeah, and don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> oh, well, no. Don't screw it up. I mean, there's really no alternative. We really can't. Well, we 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 can screw it up. Uh, human beings being selfish and 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 must have my own way. Or, uh, but we, we got to get. Well, off. if you we have to get off that. If you look at the uh, the the writings of Hobbes or Locke, uh, the state of nature, mm-hmm. um, left without rules is is a terrible thing. You know, um, people will always try to better their their own position. Sure. Um, but luckily for Locke, he, 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 he said we have the, the divine right to fight against somebody who wrongs us. So that's why, sure. Why laws are, let me put it, let me put it where I am on this. Just so you'll know, I celebrate your right to say, think and believe the way you want to. I want you to celebrate mine and I want us to be able to work out our differences and remember, first and foremost, we are Americans. Mm-hmm. Americans. That's my whole deal about politics. All right. Well, my caps for president. Everybody. No, no, no. Uh, Please, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't make it past laughing stage of that. <laughs> we'd have that's heck, okay. We'd have a heck of a party. Yeah, that's, I'm telling that's you for sure. Um. So you're a little you're a little out out of sorts right now because baseball season is is over. Yeah, um, but we got the, the World Series about to crank up. We, yeah, we've got the Fall Classic going on. What? Well, who's your pick? Who 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 do you? It's see? a sentimental pick. The Kansas City Royals. Mike Jersey, the third base coach, is a dear dear friend. He was the Omaha Royals first, and then Storm Chasers manager for as long as we've been in the league until this year. And he was promoted. Uh, he was sort of an ancillary coach, and then all of a sudden, at midseason, he's changed to the third base coach. They changed their hitting coach around, and their fates change. I'm telling you, Jersey is a huge part of what's going on there because he's brought all of those kids up and given them their finishing touches at the AAA level. They love him to death, and and they, they can run, them. they can run, and that puts so much pressure on a pitcher and a defense when, when you can run like they can run. It's just a beautiful thing to watch. Looking out of the corner of your eyes, not a way you want to pitch. No, no, no. You better have it. Bumgarner will do very well. I just, it, it's going to, it's going to come down to who wants it the most. And I don't look for them to go undefeated in the world series. I don't see how anybody can, but I mean, they've set an all time major league record for wins in the postseason. The Royals in five. Royals and six, seven. I think it's a seven-game series. It's going to be a good series then. I think so. I think it's going to be beautiful. Beautiful. Now, um, F1's in town. Yeah. Are you going? You know, probably not. And and the reason is uh, when that's here, that's starting to wind me down for my time when I'm really making the last run to see grandchildren. And and, uh, uh, Karen and I have a trip coming up to Europe uh, over the Christmas holidays and and finishing touches on that. And then I'm starting to get back into the sales season flow with the Round Rock Express. And so a lot of stuff hanging fire. And and really to have – if you're going to go do Formula One, you've got to hang out for days and really do it right. And there there will come a a time – chopper there will come right? that's right there will come a time when we will do that we just this this, this season year. we can't do it okay um but i celebrate it being here isn't it cool oh yeah i just think it's the greatest thing in the world it's really cool we got a we got a show speed city here that that right keeps us in touch with um the racing i i need to get out there I, from what i understand the track is amazing it's one of the best in the world i've heard that and um but i i know nothing about f1 i mean it, you might as well be talking about cricket. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, Halloween's right around the corner. You got your... Uh, oh, yeah. What are you going to be? Well, Karen's going as a witch, okay. and I'm going to dress up. Uh, did you ever see uh, Leo Gorski and the Hardy Boys? Uh, not Hardy Boys. What do they call those? Uh, uh, old 40s movie. 
and I can't remember anyway, the Bowery Boys. Bowery, Bowery Boys. Boys. I'm going with my Bowery Boys hat and black sunglasses, black turtleneck, black jacket, black shoes, black pants, a whole bit. Okay. And um, I got to look that can up. Can I say, um, she's going as a witch, I'm going as a witch's bitch. <laughs> I guess you probably can't say that you on television, it. can you? Yeah, no. It, it, if you saw our last episode, we said much worse on that one. Okay. Um, well, I I can't tell you how excited I am to sit here with you and, and have a chat. But also, um, you, you've made me a lover of baseball again, Mike Caps. Well, I appreciate that. And yeah. and and I thank you. Um, and I can't wait till next season. I'm gonna. Well, I, hopefully, I'll be. On this side of the board, it's pretty bad when you when you show up at places where people have invited you to come to their house or come to see them during the summer and you can't go. Then you show up in the fall and they start looking at their watch about thirty minutes into the visit, wondering when spring training right. starts. <laughs> When's this guy going to be busy again? <laughs> oh, God, he's wearing us out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. For always sitting down with me and um, you take anytime, care. buddy. Jimmy Preston, Jimmy Preston's a horse. Yes. Boy, he carried the ball this weekend with the technical problems. You guys did a great job, Jimmy, and you spread the word to each and every one of them. A big thank you.